into a spin degrees of freedom. Hi, my name is Steven Master and I'm Dr. Kilan said I'll be talking about the spin degrees of freedom. We cannot hear you. Can oh, sorry. A little bit do, louder. Do we need to launch uh, the presentation mode? Oh, right, right, right. You can't tell, I'm a little nervous. All, okay. I've, all I've had to eat today is coffee. <laughs> so, as you can take, if you are not in the good mood to speak all the. Uh, Hello? Uh, yeah. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Yep. So, my name is Steve Mustra, and as Dr. Kellen said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, spin degrees of freedom in electrons, and specifically the free induction decay of electrons and magnetons in NMR. So, first, uh, we're going to have to cover some theory, since, as he said, mine is very different from everyone else's. So, that would be what exactly is spin? And that is a very hard question. <laughs> if it wasn't, I'd probably have no real problem. So it's an intrinsic property of electrons and other fundamental particles, which doesn't really tell us anything. It's uh, more actually, it's a form of angular momentum of a particle. And probably the analogy, it's a ball that's spinning, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. So then what is it? Well, specifically, the spin number of an electron is the eigenvalue of a wave equation for the k number of states where the wave function is an eigenfunction of s hat z for the summation of k terms of s hat z k. So that would be the, uh, basically the z uh, value for a, uh, a vector of uh, magnetization, basically. So that allows us to see that they'd be represented by a sphere, basically. That would be a block sphere. Well, what is a block sphere? It's a geometric, geometric representation of a qubit where the poles of the sphere represent the 0 and 1 states. Uh, more usefully, it's a way of visualizing the magnetic vector of a spinning electron as it moves uh, through a magnetic field. So we have our magnetic vector is equal to uh, g, summation of k of the s k of time t, where the s k is the combination of the x, y, and z components of the vector, which are controlled by uh, these uh, equations, which I will show later. So, now what is a spin echo? So, as the magnetic moments of a, a group of electrons move around a block sphere, on, around the equator, that at one point in time, they will synchronize and constructively combine their signals into one very large signal. Now, the exact time that this happens for an atom is unique to each atom and to each electronic environment, or so how it's bonded uh, for every single state that there can be. This is the principle behind how NMR spectroscopy can differentiate elements and atomic structure this way. And now we have a very, very messy graph. So what's happening on this graph is that all of our uh, electrons in the magnetic moment in the ensemble start at the same level, the uh, pulse, the half pi magnetic pulse that brings the electrons from the poles of the, of the block sphere onto the equator, which is represented by these two lines, at which point the varying uh, individual frequencies that they move around the equator, uh, which is dependent on their individual electronic environment, cause them to diverge into these various uh, purple and yellow orange lines until they reach the pi pulse which uh, flips them 180 degrees in the sphere. And as you can see, that changes the way. So now instead of diverging away from one point on the sphere, they are now on the opposite side, converging towards a separate point on the opposite side, which is represented here and here. And so we have two identical signals, despite the fact that they are now in different places in time and space. And so a more useful visualization if you can't really wrap your head around that. We have our electrons here at the top of the block sphere, which are then moved to the equator by the 90 degree or half pi pulse, so that they are now in the xy plane of the sphere. They then proceed, the various uh, electrons, since this is more than one, move in various ways around the sphere at different rates, 
and that's thus they uh, counteract and destructively combine to reduce the total of the signal that you would see. This is until the pi pulses are uh, received by them, at which point they flip to the opposite side of where their positions were originally on the sphere, and they now begin to converge to a single point on the opposite side of the sphere. So, a nice thing I got from Wikipedia shows this in a smooth motion. Mm -hmm. And you see that at one point they converge on the opposite side and uh, form a new signal even though that there shouldn't be any uh, magnetization present. Now what did I do exactly? Well, as the electrons move, they move at different rates. The Specifically it's called the, uh, dis the disorder is the variance between uh, each individual magnetic moment as it moves. So, as stated earlier, they are defined by the summation of the x, y, and z coordinates, which are defined by various differential equations. The important uh, variable in this is the plus or minus i delta omega k. They do so at different rates. The difference between those is defined by the delta omega k. So here are the two electrons, the, not electrons, the two formulas that I used earlier in the uh, formula to divine, define the uh, magnetic vector. And here we have the delta uh, omega k uh, components, which are the important factors. So in the MATLAB code, delta omega k is represented as a multiple of omega. As you can see here, the original was uh, 0.015, where this can be, rep x represents any uh, value that would differentiate between the different uh, speeds that they move, with x is uh, starting at 0.01 in 0.025 increments uh, up to uh, 0.02. So what does that look like? So here we see the signal that you would receive on the block sphere, where as they move around the uh, equator at different rates, they destructively uh, counteract each other's signal until they converge at a single point and we see a sudden surge in signal on the opposite side. Now, graphed to link to the YouTube video that uh, Dr. Killen helped me put together, oh, that I took that from. If we graph that, we see this sort of graph, where the, uh, the orange and blue line combined represent the uh, measured magnetic signal. Now, as you can see, as disorder increases, this is uh, 0.01, uh, 0 0.0125, 0 0.015, and increasing so on to 0.02. The uh, width of the peak increasingly narrows the larger the disorder is between them. So this is a very important as uh, the width of the peak uh, is a limitation in the resolution ability of an NMR to distinguish different uh, electronic states. So if we graph that as a combination of the area of the peak over the multiples of W, we see this very smooth uh, sloping uh, trend line as the disorder of, uh, of the state of the magnetic moments increases. And the, it says T2. I'm sorry, I did not uh, define what that is. T2 is the relaxation time, the time that it takes for an electron that's been put through a magnetic uh, field and been brought to the XY plane to return to its initial uh, sort of state after it's removed from the electronic field. This uh, value is different for every uh, element and is part of the, the way that spin echo is used as a way of uh, determining the, the state of the atom. So what happens if we make the disorder really, really large, like seven times as large as the original one that uh, we started with? And something very interesting happens. The total area of the peak completely breaks down and the, it loses all symmetry. There's no symmetrical large peaks on either side. And what I'd speculate about what's causing this at this point <coughs> is that the disorder is so large between each individual magnetic moment that they aren't able to uh, immediately constructively rephase into a single point. By the time the first ones are rephasing, the other electron magnetic moments are still far around the sphere and by the time the last ones are rephasing, the first ones have already returned to their initial values. Question? Okay, good, thanks, Stephen.
<laughs> now we're almost 10 minutes. <laughs> and presentation is open for discussion. Yes. You mentioned that this is kind of applicable to the NMR spectroscopy. Yes. But then you were also talking about like in